Hello, thanks for joining us at this West London Sport QPR podcast. I'm Dan Bennett here with the usual lineup of Ian McCullough, Ben Kosky, and former QPR striker Kevin Gallen. So the panic's over. Winless run of uh, four games in the league is over. QPR beating Blackpool 2-1 uh, last night. We filmed this the day after the, the win. Um, wasn't straightforward, of course. Um, QPR looked the better team in the first half. Obviously went down to 10 men with Dion Sanderson reacted angrily to a challenge from Reese James and sort of put his head into to Reese James and the referee sent him off. Um, I want to come on to some of the sort of tactical decisions that Mark Warburton made before the game, um, you know, going into the game in, in a sec. But first of all, Kev, I mean, it's just a massive result, isn't it? Given the pressure that's kind of been on the team recently, Mark Warburton's obviously had to face a lot of questions about the results and kind of called for a bit of calmness and pointed to where they are in the league. But to kind of break that winless run and get back to winning ways ahead of what's going to be a massive game against Blackburn on Saturday is just really big, isn't it? Yeah, no, fantastic to get three points. Um, not sure, I wasn't there, so I, from what I heard, it wasn't the greatest of performances, but at this stage um, in the season, you need to pick up points when you don't play great. Um, it does give us, I think, it's a bit of a weight off not only the players, but a, a little bit of the supporters as well, a weight off their shoulders, and we can sort of calm, you know, calm down a little bit. Uh, and um, we sort of uh, we had a little blip. Every team does, but we sort of nipped it in the bud uh, quite quickly. So it, it hasn't sort of escalated into like a, a five, six, seven game where where you don't win a game. A bit like West Bromwich Albion that look like they've completely gone. We haven't gone into that, so we're back on track, and that will give the team uh, confidence going which will be a tough game at Blackburn on Saturday. Um, who, who lost, I think, they lost last night, is that right? Yeah, Sheffield United, uh, yeah, lost 1-0. They lost 1-0, so they'll be trying to they'll be trying to get back on track as well because they're, they're vying for a player spot. So it's a, it's a really good, important, uh, really good res, uh, a result, great three points, and, you know, hopefully can kick on and get a good performance and a good uh, result at Blackburn on Saturday. Yeah, so, I mean, so the big talking point, obviously, before the game was when the team's teams come out and Mark Warburton opted not to go with one of his fit strikers. Obviously, Lyndon Dyke's still out injured with a knock. Uh, Charlie Austin and Andre Gray on the bench, but he sort of went with Willock as the furthest forward player and then kind of chair a little bit behind him, which I think surprised a lot of people. I mean, afterwards, he got asked about it a couple of times once by me and, and, and another reporter as well, but he sort of just said it was a, a tactical decision, um, that it wasn't a reflection on Charlie Austin and Andre Gray. Charlie Austin's got a huge role to play on and off the pitch for QPR in terms of his, he's a senior player, the mentoring role in the dressing room is so important, you know, the message gets across to the young players is so important, but it is about tactics. Tonight was pretty nothing about Charlie and Andre, tonight was changing the tactics to try and win a game of football, simple as that, it was for, sometimes at the half when they're up against players, they like to mark them, so we want to try and take away that luxury and try and, I'm not saying confused, that's the wrong word, we want to pose a problem. Uh, and that was the idea behind it. So, you know, nothing about Charlie, Andre, then they're coming back. We've got three good quality centre forward. So, we've got to make sure we maximise their attributes at the right time. If Chris hadn't been, if it was 11 11, Charlie would have been involved in, in the season. Absolutely. We would have made to be there. We knew what we wanted to do later in the game involving Charlie and Andre. But unfortunately, that, that option was taken away from us. Um, what do you make of, did you make of those comments, Kev? Um, and do you think this was a tactical call? Was it? Or was it just that he felt Willock was a better option as a striker than the two he had on the bench at the moment? What do you think? Well, I, I would say that um, he, he can call it a tactical, but he obviously thought that Willock was the better option on the night than Andre Gray and then Charlie Austin. And and, uh, and I would assume, being an ex-striker, that those two lads who sat on the bench the whole game and didn't get on at all, that um, they'll be... That would be, I'd be devastated, not devastated, but I'd be guided about that and I'd be knocking on the manager's door as if to say, hold on a minute, you're not even playing a fit striker, you're not even playing a striker and I'm a striker and so is he and you're not even playing, playing us. So it worked, but he put himself under a lot of pressure because if it hadn't have worked, you know, there would have been a lot more questions from uh, you guys, the press, and a lot more questions from the fans because... I even I wasn't at the game, but even I was getting 
uh, text messages saying he's not even playing a striker. What's going on? And I'm, I'm like, well, well, let's wait and see. Thankfully, in the end, QPR won 2 1. We won 2 1. So it, it worked out in the end. But if I was Andre Gray and Charlie Austin, I would be very disappointed not even to get on the pitch at some stage because Willock did come off. And you're thinking, if the, the makeshift striker comes off, you're looking and you're thinking, hold on, am I going to go up front? And obviously, he didn't think they were the better option than Ilya's chair. It's, just, it's, it's a strange one. Um, it'd be interesting to see what his uh, formation and what his uh, team will be for Saturday at Blackburn now. Will he go and um, play, if Lyndon Dykes is still injured, will he go and play Willock up front like he did as a makeshift sort of fault, as that, that word, false number nine? Uh, Willock's a good player. He probably thought on the night that's the best option we have, but the two lads, the two centre forwards, will be very, very disappointed in that. I, I assume. Yeah. So he did say after as well, Warburton, that they had a plan to use Charlie Austin and Andre Gray, but that plan was taken away by Sanderson's red card, and obviously they put Don Ball on and people like that, and obviously they went with Chair as the kind of lone striker, and then they brought him off for George Thomas as well. I guess maybe he wanted some a bit more running, but he obviously felt that whatever he wanted when the team were trying to you know sit back and defend what they had that Austin or Gray couldn't really provide that and that Chair or Thomas would be a better option. Um, I suppose, Ian, the disappointing thing is, I mean, you've mentioned kind of before we came on that you quite like the system um, that he'd gone with, but I suppose the, the disappointing thing is obviously Sanderson's red card is frustrating because it probably, you know, it pains me to say as a Blackpool fan, but it looked like it was going to be a quite a comfortable victory for QPR based on the way that first half was before the red card, but Another kind of element to that is because of that red card, we didn't really get to see the system enough to know if it worked or not. It's a bit, you know, it's a shame we didn't get to see that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the red card was silly. Just walk away, take the free kick, get up. I mean, it, it was something or nothing, but don't give the referee a decision to make. Don't put your head in his face. The, the fella didn't even go down and make a meal of it, but the, it was right in front of the ref. You can't do that. You're going to get, you know, and after that, the, the game plan almost went out the window in the second half. They... Uh, I mean, I thought like Rangers dealt with Blackpool quite comfortably until Fowler scored. Uh, Dieng made a, a fairly routine save from a header, but apart from that, I didn't really didn't really trouble Rangers <sighs> defensively. Mm-hmm. But they couldn't get out their own half Rangers in any ways. It was going up and it was just coming straight back. But that's often been the case with the striker up front in some of the recent games. So um, I thought he got his spot on Wolverton. I thought I liked, you know, he had you know Hendrik. And field in the middle of the park and then playing your handsome further forward with chair in almost like a, a front three rather than will it being up front on his own. I, I thought it worked well. I liked it. I mean, something different. Um, you know, and I thought he got the changes right as well. Thomas came on, had some legs, as did Amos, and subsequently they both, you know, created the winner between them. Um, yeah, it was a, I mean, really on paper, you look at a game like Black Black, or, you know, decent side, but you sort of go, well, that's a, should, you should win that if you're going to go up. But when you're playing against 10 men for with sorry with 10 men for 50 minutes, it becomes a, a completely different game. And uh, you know, when they equalize 82 minutes, you sort of think mm, it's gonna be one of those nights, and is this gonna be points dropped? And then you know, the whole complexion of the game and you know, potentially the season changes, you know, in the final minute of the game. And and you have to save whatever happens with Rangers this season. You one thing you can't fault is the kind of character. And I mean, they've got late goals at Reading, Barnsley. Bristol City, Coventry, West Brom, Derby this season and last night. And, you know, the fitness and the desire is not in question. And, you know, and that's, you know, you can't, you, and I know that Warburton's always talked about having a tight squad. And I think that's, there, that is a factor as well. He wants a tight squad to create that unity and have that togetherness. So, mm. um, you know, it's, it's kind of coming through and it's, was it 13 games of the season left and third place? It's, yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're in a really, really good position. Were you surprised not to see Austin or Gray in the starting eleven? Though I mean, does it does it um, reflect on them at all? Do you do you think, in your opinion? I wasn't surprised to see Austin because I don't think he played very well on Saturday. Against yeah, no, Paul. I don't think he. I think that was the um, right call. But I'm, I was a bit surprised not to see Gray, and I thought Gray might. Yeah, play I thought well. I thought Gray might come on when they went down to ten men and just as a, a speed up front. But hmm. again, is he? You wouldn't associate Andre Gray with hard working, would you? You know, sort of run the channels and run in from the front. I, I don't I don't mean that to slag the guy off, but it's just not really his game, is it? So that's perhaps why they didn't... He, he obviously went with, you know, the legs of Thomas, who's going to, as Ian Holloway liked to say, you know, chase after a crisp bag. It, it's kind of... 
and it worked. Yeah, I thought um, from what we saw, maybe Chris Willett wasn't at his most effective in that position. I mean, it's a very small sample size, so I don't think we can draw any big conclusions. But I thought, you know, he's better picking up the ball and driving at people. I thought with him being the furthest forward player in the striker, he played a lot with his back to goal. Maybe that doesn't suit him as well. But I mean, Ben, what do you think this is something we could see more of going into the rest of the season now with Willock as a striker over? I mean, obviously, Dykes coming back, maybe, you know, he's been the first choice in the all season. So, but if, if Dykes goes out or, you know, there's another challenge like Blackpool, do you think that is something we could see more of from Mark Wilburn? I think I think we might see it as a one-off. I, I mean, I would regard that. That's how I'd regard the selection for for, for the Blackpool game. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's something going forward you, you would do regularly. I mean, as Kev has said, you've got two strikers on the bench. You haven't used them. Um, a lot of people were saying they should have got another striker in. Um, you know, if you're only going to play one or none, then how many do you need? So I think... What we did see um, really was that uh, whereas perhaps Willock didn't really get to grips with with that sort of makeshift role, I thought Ilias Chair uh, did it very well um, in the second half. Um, you couldn't expect him to keep that up for, for 90 minutes, but I thought he did it really well, just trying to, you know, with his his, his running and his, his skill on the ball, just putting the black ball defence, maybe not under pressure, but just relieving the pressure on on that was coming um, on the, the, the Rangers' defence, um, and I thought he did that well. And again, I've got to give a lot of credit to the manager because I was one of those saying at half time, surely he's got to get Austin on. You've got to hold the ball up. You've got to, you know, make it stick. You need a bit of that know-how. Um, so I was surprised when Austin didn't come on at all, and and then surprised when George Thomas has come on to replace Chair. But again, you've got to uh, say. Uh, I think, as Ian said, that was extra legs and, and that was the right call because that was exactly what was needed. And um, and by the way, really pleased for George Thomas uh, to, to play such a big part in that because I think he's, uh, you know, one of those that has had a few opportunities here and there, has not really made them count. And who knows, that that just might be his turning point, you know, that he's he's played a big part in setting up. Well, what, what I think is, is a massive win. I, I think one of the biggest wins of this season. Uh, I, I really do. Psychologically, um, it, it makes a huge, huge difference. You look at the other teams who are pushing for those playoff places. Most of them have, have been winning. There's all of a sudden there's pressure on and, and Rangers have responded to that. Um, so I think we may well look back and, and say, well, the, uh, the selection seemed a bit strange. The tactics seemed a bit strange, but they worked and they got a win, which really could be absolutely huge, I think. Yeah, I think given the recent run, you know, you have to put that win up there probably with maybe like Bristol City get the game when, you know, Barbie scored the late winner, West Brom game as well when Charlie Austin scored the, the late goal. I think they're, yeah, that's right up there with that. Um, I mean, just to, to add to that, I mean, we, we've got an interview with um, Les Ferdinand over on our YouTube channel. If you've not seen that, go sort of check it out. I sort of asked him about um, the decision not to bring a striker in in January and he essentially said that, they did have that discussion, him and Mark Warburton and, and everyone else, but they opted not to bring someone in because Mark Warburton was happy with the options he had. I think we spoke about that, um, but the manager was happy with what he had. Um, you know, the, like, as I said, no player comes through the door without uh, the manager wanting it. That wasn't the position that he felt we, he, he wanted to add to in terms of his squad. It was more a number 10. Um, and like I said, we, we looked around for what we, what we needed. Um, and we weren't able to get the, the, the number 10 that we, we, got, we required. But um, yeah, uh, from, from my perspective, I know centre forwards are a, a key to, to, to football clubs, but the manager was happy with what he had. Yeah, it was just a case of that, was he? He was just happy with the three guys that he had already and did, didn't feel like he needed to add another body, essentially? No, he didn't, he didn't feel like he, he, he needed to add another centre forward. Like I said, it was he felt more in a number 10 because of the way that the team was set up and the, the way we're, we aim to play. Um, he felt that more times than not we were going to play with one centre forward and, and, and have those, those number 10s so we were going to fill in those positions. I mean, Kev, you, uh, you were quite vocal in January when we did a few of the podcasts that another striker would be your kind of preference that you'd want to see that. And I have to admit at the time, I wasn't sure. I was, I was kind of doubting you a little bit. But after seeing what, you know, the last few games, I think I'm, I'm on board with you now. I know it's too late because we're almost in the end of February and, um, you know, I'm late to the party. I'm just reacting to what I've seen. But 
I, I do think that is something that they should perhaps have done in January. I mean, do you feel now, you know, having heard that short justification, do you feel, and seeing the last few games, do you feel like they're lacking something there? Do you, do you see that in the team? Do you think another striker is going to cost them and not having another striker is going to cost them? Well, I, I hope not, but I, I, I still stand by what I said in January. I still feel if they could have got a striker in, I don't know who was available, but if they if they could have and they turned it down, I think I think that's a mistake. I think just going back to when I was playing, uh, and we got promoted in 2004, and we had um, I was just up front, me Paul Furlong, we had Tony Thorpe, and then Ian Holloway brought in Jamie Curran as well, who's a very good player and had a good record for scoring goals. And it didn't upset the changing room. Um, Jamie Curran didn't really play that much. All four, all four P was sort of me and Paul Furlong sort of were sort of mainstays of the last two or three months. So it didn't upset um, the changing room. No, didn't upset you, <laughs> first choice. No, 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 yeah. But <clears throat> we were doing well, so... Yeah. But maybe if they weren't there, we might not have been doing well because we might, do you know what I mean? Because we had to play well because we'd lose, lose our place and there was competition. That's what I'm trying to say. That's my point. And when you see a new player come in and you're thinking, hold on a minute, I've got, I've got up my game because he wants to play and I want to play. So I've got up do the business in training and when I get an opportunity on the pitch and um, that, that sort of competition creates a little bit of pressure but I think it's good pressure because if you want to play and uh, I, I just, I, look, last night, Warburton has got two strikers on the bench. I don't know what the, he says it's tactical, whatever, but he obviously thought for that game that those two strikers were not going to give the team what he wanted. So he's gone for Willock. Now, is that more about work rate, running, holding the ball up? Winning headers, I don't know. That's a question for him. But what I'm, I'm thinking is, and then, and then he puts chair up front, and then he puts George Thomas up front. Those, I've gone back. I'm going back to what I said five minutes. Those two lads on the bench must be doing this. What's going on? Because if I was on the bench, I would be going mental. I would be. I would. I would be going. I'd be raging. Even though we went brilliant, lads. We won with three points. Brilliant. I'd be like, what's going on here? So to not bring a striker in, I think last night sort of justifies, not justified, but sort of goes with what I've been saying. We should have got a striker in because he obviously, for some reason, last night he didn't think those uh, Andre Gray and Charlie Ops, Austin were up for it, were up to the task against Blackpool at home. Now make mm. of that what you want. I mean, yeah, those two guys are, you know, they've got a lot between them. I don't know how many championship goals they must have scored, but a lot, you know, they're obviously they're more experienced guys now, you know, they're coming... I mean, not, not right at the end of their careers, but they're nearer to that than they are, you know, the start. So there is that. But, you know, they're two really experienced guys, got a lot of championship goals. And, you know, it was a little bit surprising not to see them get on. I mean, like I said, Warburton said that they would have got on if it wasn't for the red card. But it, it definitely was a, um, a bold decision and luckily it paid off. But, I mean, obviously Dykes was out injured, um, Ben. You know, he's hopefully potentially coming back for Saturday or if not, it won't be long after that. But... How do you feel going into the final stretch with sort of Dykes, Austin, and and Gray as the three strikers? Do you, do you feel like that's enough? Are you confident in that? From my point of view, yes. Um, I think when you look around the championship, if if we're quite honest, with the exception of Mitrovic at Fulham, how many other teams would you say have got a regular goal scorer? Have got maybe the kind of striker we're talking about? I I don't think there's that many. Um, and I think those three strikers, they, they all offer different things. Maybe that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean they, they cover everything, um, but I think they offer different things for different situations, different matches. Um, and, you know, and in many ways, I, th I think you would have to say that the, the sort of the, the basis of uh, QPR's performances generally this season, it has been the players around the, the strikers, really. It's it's not been the strikers themselves. Um, it's been people like Willock, Cher, um, sometimes the, the wing backs, you know, the, the people sort of making things happen in, in the centre of the park. And so 
yeah, I, I think you've got to be reasonably happy with, uh, with, 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 with that setup. And as I said, I would expect that, that that formation against Blackpool is not one we're going to see very often, not to say we won't see it at all, but um, I, I don't see it happening um, all, all that regularly. And I think, um, you know, I mean, for me, I, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. I would always rather see two strikers playing in a team. Um, I, I always think pairs are, are better, you know, so none is is very strange. But um, but I think, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are options there, is, is, is what I'm saying. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd feel, feel reasonably confident going into these last 13 games from that point of view. Yeah, so what you just touched on there as well, I mean, that was a big thing Les Ferdinand said um, to me as well, was that the, re- the reason that maybe Warburton didn't want a striker was because he felt that with the system that they play, it'd be one striker more often than not. And the kind of number 10s around him were more important and he just wanted a bit more depth because, you know, they've been lucky with not having chair and kind of Willock out with with injury this season. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, on the strikers, the, the three going into the end of the season, Ian? How, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I mean, end of the day, they are the second top scorers in a division. Yeah, um, with Bournemouth, they were all beat Bournemouth. We got games in hand, so I think in some ways the strength of the team is that the goals have been shared around. So you've got the strikers, plus you've got Chair's got eight. I think Willis got seven. Amos has got three. I think Dicky's got four. They're all kind of Dunn's got three. They're, the goals are coming from different areas of the field. So that's probably another factor why he didn't feel the need to get a striker in because he's kind of happy with what they got. It's always a risk. I mean, you know, if you've got a chance to bring in someone that can get, you know, so like Cameron Archer at Preston, for example, was coming out of a massive effect straight away, score goals. But Rangers aren't really struggling to score goals. That's sort of where, how I see it. And I sort of, I don't know. I think FFP still lingers and you don't, you bring someone in on a two-year contract and they're on strikers earn the big money. You don't go up. Everything you built over the last sort of five years to get to where you are now could be just brought down. You've got to sell players undervalued to get them off the books, that kind of thing. So I wasn't that upset they didn't bring a striker in. I've got to be brutally honest. If they go up, brilliant. But if I don't go up, I don't think it's the end of the world if I don't go up. Whereas I think clubs like Bournemouth and Fulham have to go up. You know, if Rangers sell an asset in the summer, you then reinvest that money and bring in players to make you stronger for next year. And then you can maybe bring in a striker. Um, you know, Gray's on loan. You're not, you're not, you know, tied into him long term. Uh, Austin's got one more year left on his contract. And then you've got Dykes who, you know, I think will get better. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with what they've done. It doesn't really, it didn't really bother me that they didn't bring a striker in. Mm. Um, that's not to say if someone had to come in that's a proven goal scorer, you, you wouldn't turn it down. But, you know, I've seen some of the reaction to your interview with Les, um, Dan, on various social media channels has been a bit over the top. And Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I see where Kevin's coming from as well. So, but, you know, the fact that they're third with 13 games to go, second joint top scorers in the league it's it, it, it kind of I think the manager deserves a little bit of trust in what he's doing and if he doesn't feel he needs a strike then, then fair enough yeah I mean you touch on it you bang on there I think it's not it's not a big cause for worry is it I mean obviously the recent results have been great before the Blackpool game but given where the team is at and how many goals they've scored this season I don't think we need to panic about it too much I, I do think and I've said this before that it is a slight missed opportunity not bringing in either another striker or like a number number 10 creative player, which is what they wanted. You know, we know that they were trying to, they were trying to sign Tom Lawrence at Derby and Jamie Patterson at Swansea, but couldn't agree deals for either. I just think last night as well, having that kind of another creative option, even if it's coming off the bench. I mean, you know, to be fair, George Thomas came on and did really well, but he's not been, you know, providing consistently over his time at QPR. So I do think having that other option would have been good, but, you know, the team's in a good place right now going into a big game against Blackburn. So I don't think we need to panic too much. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for watching. Um, please leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. Uh, comment below what you think about what we've discussed today and subscribe to the channel if you've not already. And we'll be back later in the week with our predictions for Blackburn on Saturday.